into the compression department where you can compress that powder into tablets or you can encapsulate it into capsules. And these are high speed automated pieces of equipment with long changeover times because when you change from product A to product B, you gotta pull out every one of those uh, compression uh, dies and replace them with the next tablet which has got the tablet name on it or some kind of uh, uh, identifier for that particular pill. pill. Then the output of this are tablets or capsules. Those could be coated, those could not be coated, those could be dried, not dried, but for simplification they basically go into a high speed packaging line where they're dropped into a bottle at high rates. And then these, pack these bottles go down the line, they get labels placed on them, carton together, cartons go into boxes, boxes go into pallets, pallets go into a finished goods warehouse or a truck where it goes to the customer. They were a mixture of multiple packaging lines. They had some high volume lines that ran at high speeds and were hard to change over. They had some low volume lines that ran at lower speeds that were a little easier to change over. Um, and they had long cleaning times uh, between uh, the packaging. Um, very similar to every other um, oral solid dosage plant I've been in since. But this was the first one I've ever worked in. Okay, so what did they do first? <coughs> um, the first thing they did, Glenn called it phase one. They did four things. Um, they looked in their MRP system, this is BPICS, and they found that they did not have accurate routings or work center data. So some of the products were routed to go through a machine that they had shut down a couple of years ago and they had bought a replacement for, and they hadn't updated the routes. Um, or the work center data itself, the, the schedule for how many shifts that was going to run hadn't been kept up to date. <coughs> so they would assume in the MRP it was running two shifts a day and it was only running one and a half shifts a day, something like that. So they cleaned that up. That was a pretty easy fix. Um, then they figured out a way how to do shop floor sequencing by coming up with daily work center schedules and shift schedules. So they basically had a list and it showed every batch that needed to come out of each work center. There were some problems with that, and I'll talk about it in a little bit. And then they did capacity planning. Um, they basically used rough cut capacity planning, the same functionality that's been in every MRP system since the late 70s, to see where are my bottlenecks um, and how can I try and avoid overbooking them. They didn't have anything fancy when it came to available to promise or capable to promise. They just could see several quarters in advance where their bottleneck was going to be. Very similar functionality to what we have today in capacity analysis. Um, and they did barcoding. They, they developed a homegrown system so that when they moved anything in the shop floor, they would scan it. And then they integrated that with their MRP system. So the MRP system at least had accurate information on where every batch was. Any questions on any of that? Um, this, is a, this is a complicated graph I won't spend a lot of time on. Um, if you care to, there's a detailed explanation of it in the case study I can pass out later. Basically what we did in phase one is we changed some of their strategic, um, the, the, the strategy for some of the things they were doing inside the plant. We changed some of the tactics and we changed some of the control mechanisms. What did we change on the strategy? Well, we did this rough cut capacity planning to find out where the bottleneck was and how many people they needed to, to, to hire. Um, and we did some aggregate planning so you could see by month, um, I should say they did it because this was all before they hired me, uh, by month how many we needed to produce of each product. Um, on the sequencing and scheduling side, they printed out these Excel spreadsheets that were lists of everything every work center needed to have. Um, and then a shop floor control, they had this barcoding so they had a better idea of what was moving where on the floor. And all that was part of what they did in phase one. So what results did they have? They got accurate inventories, accurate bills of material, they had these detailed work center daily schedules. Um, and they had ship schedules tied to plant output and slightly better information flow, but, and Glenn would say that's a big but, uh, they still had schedule non-compliance and constraint, the constant schedule changes. Um, they tell war stories, this was again before my time, that they print out these schedules in the morning with a timestamp on it. No. We might have that dysfunctional working problem. Um, they had constant schedule changes. They would print this thing out at 9 o'clock in the morning. And then by 10 o'clock, they'd have to change it. And they'd have to print it out with a new timestamp on the bottom. 
and somebody would run it off the nine o'clock version, and somebody else would have the ten o'clock version, and uh, they'd get confused as to which order they were supposed to run next. They had very high inventory, slow cycle times, poor workflow between the departments. That earlier graph that I showed, uh, blending, leading compression, leading packaging, they had a pile of inventory in between each department. Lots of overtime and a lot of misshipments. So this is where I had a chance to start working with them. Well, one thing I'll give them high marks for is quality compliance. They figured out exactly what they needed to do to prevent the FDA from shutting them down. And they weren't doing and much they else. they did just that. Right. Is that what most of them do in these situations? Yeah, it's kind of the base level of performance that a manufacturing plant manager and pharmaceutical <clears throat> has to do. Because if you get a warning letter from the FDA, then you get fired. Right. So it's like the price of admission to be a plant manager in pharma. Glenn came from chemicals, and he said, well, I've already got the systems in place to prevent the plant from getting shut down by the FDA. And I know that a competitive plant is going to have fast cycle times and low inventories, and let's figure out how we can get to a higher level of performance and become a plant that actually competes instead of one that just doesn't get shut down. Okay, so we did a baseline analysis. I mentioned this was pretty early in our relationship. Um, MRP was creating excessive work and process inventory. Why? I think probably everybody knows why. Uh, basically, they were pushing work onto the floor, regardless of whether the floor needed more work. Um, the MRP system did not account for variability in any way. It was assuming every batch of product A went through with the same cycle time. Whether or not the machines visited by product A were heavily utilized or not heavily utilized. Um, this was encouraging the organization to do lead time padding. If you're familiar with that phrase, uh, the way the dynamic works is, uh, let's, say, let's say Therese is the planner for their hypertension medication, and she's been told, never miss an order. You know, never miss a customer's order due date. So if you had assumed it was going to take four months to produce that product, and then one time it took four and a half months, you'd go in the next day and change the lead time to five months. Right. And then if sometime after that, one batch took five and a half months, you go in and change lead time to six months. That's called lead time tag. So you got this perpetual cycle where you're pushing the order out onto the floor four months, five months, six months before it's due because your incentive is to never miss an order. And the MRP encourages that. We spent a lot of time with basics like Little's Law, same math we used at Alcoa, that, hey, the more cycle time you're putting into MRP, for whatever level of throughput, the more inventory you're going to get. And let's talk about what's going to happen to your cycle time as variability influences things and as your utilizations change. And I'll show you that graph. Um, and basically, it was these long cycle times that were causing them to miss shipments. So the methodology we used was to make. This has gotten a lot of airtime lately because we've been talking about workflows. Um, the very first thing they did was define how they wanted materials to flow through their plant. And we defined flow paths. I'll show you that graph in a second. And they decided what they wanted to implement to first hit the targets they needed for throughput and cycle time. That was their biggest pain initially. And after we solved that, having gone through all these steps, we came back and fixed uh, shipping performance, customer service. So we defined the flow paths, then we measured each of the flow paths on metrics like cycle time. Then we analyzed each of the flow paths using tools like Six Sigma and Factor Physics to see how could we cut the cycle time. What is it that needs to change in the flow path so that we could get lower and lower cycle times. Um, finally, they would go out on the shop floor and they would change something, cut their setup times. That was a project we did where they cut the change over time on a packaging machine from eight hours down to four hours, and that allowed them to get farther and farther towards lower cycle times. And then finally, the big piece that, that was necessary was to put in place the tools so the people on the shop floor would continue to operate this way 
um, after the project was over and after the consultants left. 